Hello. Hello, hello. Okay. Good afternoon. So that's the Hubert Humphrey Latin American team. Good, let's get started then. We're going to talk about uh, climate change in Bolivia. I am a Hubert Humphrey fellow from Bolivia. And uh, what we are going to see now, it's uh, a reflection about what is going on first at the global level. And then we are going to have a look on what's the situation right now in uh, my country, which is supposed to be a leading country when it comes to climate change uh, issues. So yeah, thanks for being here and let's get started. So we're going to have a look on uh, some background information about Bolivia. Then we'll uh, see what are the main uh, causes of climate change at a world scale. Then we'll move to see what's the impact of climate change in Pachamama, which means Mother Earth, right? And finally, we are going to see what are the choices that we face now. So there's Bolivia located, I like to say that it's located in the heart of South America. And then, uh, do you know where the name Bolivia comes from? So let's have a quick review on that. There was this say, if from Romulus comes Rome, then from Bolivar comes Bolivia. That was Congressman Manuel Martin approved by the Republic in 8025. So uh, Bolivia was supposed to be the favorite daughter of Simon Bolivar, uh, who was the liberator of many countries uh, in this uh, region, not only Bolivia. But then what happened? Uh, a few years ago, in 2009, a new national constitution changed the official country name to Plurinational State of Bolivia in recognition of the multi-ethnic uh, nature of the country and the enhanced position of Bolivian indigenous communities in the new national constitution. Uh, that's very important. This is I would say a huge change in a country to recognize the diversity of their population. Uh, but let's see what happens after that. Bolivia is, uh, has an area of 1.1 million square kilometers, has a population of 11 million inhabitants, more or less 60% living in urban context and 40% in rural context. The minimum salary, the official salary to be paid to a worker is $200 per month. We are highly dependent on natural resources exploitation from agriculture, forestry, fishing, mining, petroleum. The Human Development Index, its position in Bolivia in the place 108 out of 187 countries when it comes to expect life of expectancy, education and per capita income. The mortality rate of children under the age of five, it's 50 out of 1,000. Most of these uh, problems are caused and are related with water uh, problems. And Bolivia is a landlocked country. We lost the access to the Pacific Ocean against Chile. Uh, and right now we are under the international court in Den Haag with a lawsuit to try to find some solutions to this actual situation. So there you have uh, the diversity that we have in Bolivia from highlands to valleys and then to the lowlands. Once you reach the airport in La Paz, Bolivia, you are going to be at 4,000 meters above mean sea level. For some people, that's, bring, that's going to bring some problems. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we went with some Humphrey Fellows to the lowest point in USA, which is located in Death Valley, right? And then we were 
like 80 meters below mean sea level or, or something like that. Uh, so if you go to Bolivia, you are going to experience really differences in uh, altitude depending on the region you are located. Those are some of the national symbols, the flag, the shield, the cantuta flower, and this is the flag which represents many uh, indigenous communities from the Andean region, the Wipala. So let's see, let's have a look, a quick view on what are the main causes of climate change worldwide. What is climate change? We can see some definitions, uh, refers to changes in climate characteristics, including temperature, humidity, rainfall. We can find con uh, definitions of global warming, referring to the overall warming of the planet based on average temperature, which means we are living in a warmer world, right? And then what is causing this situation? And we can see that there are some natural climate fluctuations, which humans can't control, but are part of the natural system. And examples of these are El Nino and La Nina phenomenons. Uh, but then we have anthropogenic drivers of climate change, which has to do has to be with the increased greenhouse uh, gases concentration in the atmosphere. So what is causing this? Situation, human activities, right? So fossil fuel combustion uh, and the different gases that are released to the atmosphere because of human activities in the world. Here we can see a map who are the countries which are contributing more to the greenhouse emission and uh, yeah, we can say from this graph that the higher the size of this circle, the higher the amount of the country contributing to this greenhouse emission. But we can see that everybody is contributing somehow to this emission of greenhouses. Uh, and what are the impacts on climate change? We are going to have impact on ecosystems, uh, human systems, urban systems, economic, and social. So the impacts are really in different uh, areas. Biodiversity, agriculture, transportation, lifestyle, energy, equity, migration. Today morning we were talking about the, high, uh, the very high migration patterns from rural context to urban context, which maybe are caused by these situations. Rural communities are uh, realizing that the climate is changing, so they can't do any more longer activities in their realities. Uh, let's have a look now what is going on in Bolivia. And Bolivia is particularly vulnerable to climate change uh, due to a combination of factors. Uh, we've got a high biodiversity and a wide range of ecosystems. Uh, we have a high percentage of indigenous communities, like 36 ethnic groups living along the country. More than a half of the country is located in Amazon, which are lowlands areas prone to flooding. Uh, there are extreme weather conditions which led to natural disasters. And we have a con high concentration of tropical glaciers in the Altiplanic regions, which are suffering now because of climate change. If we have a look on these uh, beautiful scenarios, ecosystems from uh, the Altiplanic regions, this is the Titicaca Lake, which is shared between Bolivia and Peru. We have in the lowlands in the Amazonic region uh, beautiful biodiversity. And uh, here we can see a map of the national protected areas in Bolivia. So these are areas which are under low protected uh, from national parks, national areas, 
uh, a combination of the two uh, national reserves for wildlife. Here we can see a distribution of the 36 ethnic groups in the Amazonia region, in the Chaco region, and in the Andean highlands. Uh, near 5,000 inhabitants living under those ethnic groups. This is a map of multi-threat uh, assessment, uh, trying to assess flood, draft, fire, erosion, and freeze. So the darker the color, the uh, more under risk the area to these uh, threats. So what's the impact of climate change in Bolivia? Uh, the impact is reflected in food security, water scarcity, natural hazards, health problems, uh, forest fires, and how it looks like in, in reality. So let's go back to this map, and uh, here we can see which used to be the second largest uh, lake in Bolivia, the Popo Lake. And I think you have seen what happened with this lake recently. So here we can see some images. This was a satellite image from 2014 uh, in April. Then this was by July 2015. And this is an image of January 2016. So by last year, December last year, and the beginning of this year, we realized that the Popo Lake has disappeared. Why and what were the main causes? What are the main causes for this to happen? So among many reasons, climate change is one of the main reasons. Uh, here we can see also that there are many mining activities going on in this region and all those mining companies have to use water for their processes. So most of the water that used to recharge naturally this lake was transferred for these mining activities of these companies. Uh, here we can see another assessment of the contamination caused by these mining companies and you can see that here, where this lake was supposed to exist, uh, the impact of mining activities was, and is really huge. And it looks like this now. So those families who used to have and to make a living out of the resources from this lake, right now really don't have anything else to do. This uh, picture is uh, of the, what used to be the highest skiing uh, place in, in Bolivia, uh, Chacaltaya. So during the last 40 years, 50% of Bolivian glaciers volume has been lost and the trend is to continue disappearing. So maybe this picture was from uh, the 90s, early 90s. I went with my family as part of one holiday, like when I was a teenager, to this place, and then after a couple of years, it's just, it just gone, it disappeared, because of the melting of these glaciers, again, caused by the increase of temperature because of climate change. So what are the efforts that the Bolivian government is taking with respect to climate change? And uh, under the presidency of Evo Morales, the first indigenous president of the country, yeah, Bolivia has taken a leadership role when it comes to the negotiations going on under the climate change global agenda. Uh, and we took like a leading position in this uh, main meetings in Copenhagen and Cancun. And uh, yeah, it looks like this. 
we are enforcing the policy of vivir bien, or good living, which means like, uh, yeah, we all should be able to live uh, uh, with uh, our basic needs uh, covered. And this is the policy that the government is uh, encouraging from the very beginning. Uh, when it comes to climate change, it's uh, kind of new, the approach and the agencies that have been created to take a responsibility as part of this uh, climate change. Like in 2009, uh, there was created the Plurinational Council on Climate Change together with the Ministry of Environment and Water. In 2010, we hosted the first World People's Conference on Climate Change and the Defense of Life. By 2010, it was released by Parliament, the Mother Earth Law and Good Living, which uh, made it that Bolivia was the first country that assigned to the nature the same rights as humans under this law. Um, in 2015, we hosted the second World Conference on Climate Change. I was able to participate in this conference. Even though I was here as part of the Humphrey program, I went to Bolivia to participate in this conference as part of the NGO I'm working with there. So it seems that we have been taking some uh, interesting uh, steps when it comes to defining some laws which are going to be in favor of the environment and to take some measures about climate change. This was the main advertisement of this conference on climate change going on in Cochabamba, in my hometown. And we are supposed to be uh, in favor of Pachamama, Mother Earth, right? So this is uh, one of the many representations of Mother Earth. So this image, what, what comes to your mind when you see this image? What is behind it? What do you see here? Harmony. Abundant. Peace. Earth. Right. So what's the essence which somehow is represented in the law of Mother Earth that the Bolivian government released and presented? So the essence behind complementarity of rights, obligations, and duties. So all of us in this system are responsible for this uh, balance. Land is not a merchandise. Harmony, solidarity, historical responsibility, prevention and priority, harmonic relationship, collective wellness, regeneration, assurance, social and climate justice. So all these elements are part of the law of Mother Earth. And they were supposed to be considered somehow in practice, right? However, the practice differs from the essence behind. And let's see what is going on uh, right now in Bolivia. So here we can see in 91, uh, the red color represents the land that was deforestated. By 2005, this amount may be increased by four times. So right now, the deforestation rate that is going on in Bolivia is at as high as 350,000 hectares per year which means 320 meters per person per year. If we compare this with average numbers, Bolivia, which you remember the previous slide, where the bigger the circle, the higher the impact of greenhouse gases emission. So it seems that in Bolivia we are at the same rate because of deforestation. So each, one's, each one of us, of individuals, are 
contributing somehow to climate change because of the actual deforestation rate which is going on. At the same time, uh, there are some laws that have been released to somehow protect the use of uh, transgenic products. And here you can see uh, rural communities that are, of course, against the use of transgenic products under food security uh, assurance, these laws are being also uh, released. Here we can see a map of uh, a combination of natural protected areas and what is going on when it comes to the exploitation of petroleum and natural gas activities. And here you can see that in 70% of the areas that are natural protected areas, there are legal activities and exploitation of petroleum and natural gas going on right now. And again, even though there's a law, in order to come up with this uh, yeah, exploitation still going on, there are other laws that are approved to uh, allow these companies to keep working in these activities. This was a very, uh, yeah, a very important uh, activity that was going on. This is the National Park of Tipnis. Tipnis. This is again one of the most diverse national parks that we have in Bolivia. And uh, with a huge biodiversity and ecosystems within it. And then the government approved the construction of a huge highway to connect two main cities which would cross this national park, like this. So from here, just crossing in the middle of the park. And what happened was that many indigenous communities living in that national park decided to go against that project. And uh, at the end of the day, there were many uh, problems and uh, many groups that were involved in these uh, activities finally were sent to jail. Uh, it seems, and right now, the project was stopped because of the high impact that it produced in the communities living there. But uh, again, you don't know when and how this is going to come up again and restart with uh, some intentions to build these huge projects that are going to cause a huge impact in the environment. Uh, so finally, who is suffering the impact of climate change in most developing countries? And this is an experience from Bolivia, but for sure it's the same way in many different developing countries and developed countries as well. So these rural communities uh, are those suffering both the impact of climate change and at the same time the measures that the governments are taking in response to those problems. Deforestation it looks like this. Uh, yeah, it's really critical the situation. So I think and I guess that Mother Earth is suffering as well, right? However, there are reasons for hope. And uh, I want to share this picture. This was back in October last year when I went to participate in the climate change conference in my hometown. And as part of this uh, workshop that we had on techniques to be used in order to uh, come up with smart solutions about climate change, there was this great speaker. Uh, this lady, uh, I think she was 80 years old, an Aymara lady from the Altiplanic regions, and she was explaining to the audience uh, how the climate is changing from her perception. So from the moment she was a little children, till now, how weather has changed, 
but still she was encouraging us, the audience, that uh, yeah, there are reasons for hope and there are ways to work the land and to uh, come up with solutions at the local level to overcome the impact of the climate. And uh, then she presented this model where you have this piece of land here at the left, maybe with no techniques implemented. And at the right side, you can see the same piece of land that with improved techniques for the use of natural resources, water, land, you can really shift from this situation to this situation. And that's something that these communities are still doing right now. Again, uh, going beyond their difficulties, their lack of resources to improve their situations, but they are still using ancient techniques in order to work the land and to be somehow in balance with Mother Earth. So what are the choices that we face now? And here you can see, as part of the results from the huge, big negotiations going on in Paris and in those big events at the global level. So for sure, you, we can decide where to be. A lot is being said about how much we should be able to, uh, to allow the climate to increase, whether two degrees, four degrees, three degrees, and it seems that the conversation just focus on that indicator, which is not really saying too much. I would say that the change has to be like radical in order to try to change and try to improve this uh, problem. And the decision is in the hands of uh, global leaders, national leaders, and of course we can do something as well as individuals in this range of options. Here I want you to read what Evo Morales said as part of the Mother Earth Law. Uh, right. So this was released. As you can see, Los Diez Mandamientos para Salvar el Planeta, the 10 uh, ways to save the planet and humanity. This was released at the same time that the Mother Low Earth was passed by Parliament in December 2010, right? And this was the main, one of the main uh, ideas behind Bolivia being a leading country fighting against climate change. So more or less, yeah, yeah, right. And then he refers here to the melting of glaciers. So, yeah, again, uh, with this presentation, I wanted to give you a general idea about what is, what is going on, even though we are supposed to be doing really a good job against climate change, in reality, something else is happening. Um, maybe the measures are not really coherent with the reason behind being a country which passed by parliament a law to protect in every way and in every sense the environment, right? So, yeah, with this slide, uh, I finish the presentation and I want to open the floor for questions and comments. Before we take questions, I'll pass the clipboard around again and some, some uh, evaluations for you to fill out and return to me or a basket up front. Thank you.
again, the main elements that were highlighted as part of the Mother Earth law are, uh, yeah, like chapters of this document that you can go through. So what has been uh, realized by many NGOs, foundations that are working on climate change and environment issues have uh, recognized that the speech of the government is going in this way, but in reality what is going on is going in the opposite way, right? So allowing the exploitation of uh, natural resources within natural protected areas is really not coherent. Uh, the fact that that national park was going to be crossed by a huge high highway in order to connect, yes, it's important to have the country connected in every possible way. But maybe there were some alternatives not to simply cross this natural park and destroy that ecosystems and affect the living conditions of those ethnic communities. At the same time, giving the possibility to use uh, pesticides uh, in order to improve food security levels and to uh, have more farming activities. And the level of deforestation that is going on right now, it's really saying that this, there's really something different between the, the logic, the essence behind Mother Earth law and uh, the practices that the governments are taking, both at the national level and the transfer and the responsibility that the national level is transferring to the local government levels, right? So, yeah, it's uh, being highlighted the failure of the government to really be uh, coherent with the law. Uh, what role do you think that uh, nations like the United States have to play in either facilitating or helping developing nations with these issues? Yeah. Thanks. I think that's a, that's a difficult question because Bolivia decided to stop relationships with USA and then we throw out uh, USA agency that was working in Bolivia in a huge program to transfer the use of land from coca leaf production to the so-called alternative production program. So in order to uh, shift from, let's say, growing coca leaves, produce some fruits or vegetables or whatever. So I would say that the international cooperation has a huge role to be played in this a issue of climate change. And there are many ways to do so, like from basic knowledge transfer to economical support. It seems that now, after Paris, developed countries are supposed and are obligated to provide some economical resources. At the same time, we at the local level should be able to come up with some solutions and with some measures and with some investments in the same way. So I would say that, yeah, international cooperation has a, to, a key role to be played under these scenarios. And uh, it seems that that's going to be the trend. And specifically Bolivia, uh, I would say that uh, somehow uh, de decided not to rely too much on international cooperation. We have uh, increased our macroeconomical indicators in the last 10 years, so we are really in, in a very important position in the region. Somehow we are leading the economical growth in the last 10 years in the region, but it doesn't mean but that we have to stop considering the support of international cooperation because uh, what I show you right now, what is, uh, uh, also happening is that to address and to assess climate change, we really need a lot more data, scientific research, and that's not happening right now. 
So international cooperation should be really playing a key role in order to address what is going to be the impact of the melting of the glaciers in 10 years from now, in 20 years from now, and what are we going to do really when the situation becomes even worse. Couldn't hear it all, but uh, his question was like, what can what developing countries do to help undeveloped countries? Well, I would think it's the opposite. What what do your um, your uh, indigenous populations um, remember and can apply to renew the earth? Yeah. So. As part of these conferences going on, uh, and the picture I show at the very last part of the presentation, the proposal of indigenous communities was exactly to retake all techniques, to work the land, to use the natural resources, and to live in a more harmonic way. Like, uh, then the question comes, what is development about, and what's the development model that rural and ethnic groups are going to follow. So this is very much being applied now, that we are retaking ancient and old techniques in order to uh, shift from the picture that we showed at the very last part, how to use this piece of land in the most sustainable way and making the best use of the resources that we've got and to do so, the retake of these old techniques is really a, a proposition of many indigenous groups, not, on, not only from Bolivia. So in these conferences, we had the participation of ethnical and uh, indigenous groups from all the region and from all over the world. And all of them came up with these potential solutions in order to, again, uh, come up with some uh, combination of ideas and techniques. And the results are really there. There are many good experiences and results that we can really uh, make the best use of the resources that we've got by using basic techniques and practices. Yeah, and that's happening already. Wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your own work in Olivia. Let's wait for the projector to turn on. I prepared a short presentation for today morning, but because we changed the way to do the session in the morning, I thought I wouldn't be able to share this, but let's do it now want to share with you this uh, project and experiences that we have been working on as part of my job in the NGO, uh, working with uh, rural communities, trying to uh, create with them some solutions, again, to the problems that they are facing as part of uh, the use of natural resources. But then, um, so with the, with the NGO I've been working with, we collaborate a lot with international uh, development agencies from Europe and from USA. So this is, a, again, a project that we've been working for the last eight years in order to improve the living conditions of uh, rural communities. This is in my hometown, Cochabamba, in the Andean regions. Uh, so here what we, uh, what we can see is that these are old techniques which we wanted and we tried to retake for these communities. So more or less, the difference is that the government is providing communities with, let's say, fashion techniques 
like introducing machinery, and they don't care what is going to happen with this tractor two years from now, once they need some spare parts and things to be fixed. So what we tried to do was to retake and to reintroduce these old techniques. This was to work the land. Uh, and in this way, we involve the communities, we involve uh, different groups, ethnic groups. And once they realize and once they see that they can improve their techniques and their activities, they are going to really be able to compare whether to take this offer that they've got from other agencies or using machinery or to retake basic techniques that they can apply easily in the ground. Uh, these are some firsts where they are going to display their varieties of products that they are going to come up with. Here, uh, this little kid is showing the different varieties of potatoes that they, they have grown in this community. Uh, what we tried to do in this specific project was to highlight the fact that with the same effort that they do right now using a seed of potato, and by changing this seed to a certified seed, they can have three or four times the production increased of potato. So we came up with these uh, models that uh, they realize, again, with the same effort, with the same use of resources, they can come up with a better production, which is going to make them able to sell some more products in the market. At the same time, they have enough products for self-consumption. The techniques, again, how to uh, take advantage of water resources, like you can store water during the rainy season, and then you can use that water for irrigation purpose at moments when you don't have water, right? How to work the land and how to improve uh, the production of this same piece of land. How to diversify the diet, how to introduce some vegetables in the daily diet that they have. Uh, we encouraged, at the same way, the role of women in these communities. So trying to provide them with some uh, improvements in their daily activities, so how they can uh, be part of the, let's say, uh, economical model of the family, when both men and women can contribute somehow according with their possibilities and roles that they play in the community. Reforestation activities, Again, I show you the numbers, and in this project, we try to encourage forestation. And uh, the results and the impact was really huge, and these communities were very happy that they were able to improve and to recover those erosion lands with some native species of uh, trees. Use of uh, natural produced fertilizers for the production of uh, the different crops that they have. So here they are mixing like garlic, uh, onions, and other natural products to come up with some natural pesticides. How to introduce, again, some other products to their daily diet. And here we try to encourage the production of uh, trot in these regions that are very cold and so are the ideal conditions to produce trout. So that's part of the work that I've been involved in the last, uh, the last years. And uh, again, it's not, it's not easy. Uh, it's a situation in which we have to face different challenges. Again, the role of the government, uh, how to involve local government agencies to be part of the uh, solution, the development models for rural communities which are really not clear and that are sending again rural indigenous young people uh, who are migrating to urban areas and sustainability is also again it's a challenge in every sense from the technical, economical, social and environmental point of view sustainability is still 
a huge challenge. So yeah, that's part of the work I've been doing in the last years. Proposing one thing, like one direction, and they take responsibility towards climate change, but at the same time we saw the problem related to this lake. What the NGOs do on national, on policy level, and if there are like NGOs really working in the field of environment and natural resources management in Bolivia. Right, so you have working in the country like international NGOs, you have local or Bolivian NGOs working, which, uh, yeah, we are able to come up all together and to do some lobby, let's say, with the government agencies. But what we have seen is that, again, the, the approach and the uh, focus is, is really different. Uh, as part of this specific project I presented you right now, uh, these communities and this uh, local partner that we have in place, they have been working there for the last 40 years, trying to bring this approach as a sustainable approach and trying to learn the communities that they can really improve techniques, they can come up with some better incomes for the families and that uh, rather than providing them the resources, they are able to get their own income to get more resources and get into this sustainable model. But then the government comes from day to night to provide these communities with lots of seeds, maybe some machinery, and the communities are going to see, okay, this is better because for this model I have to work a lot harder. And right now the government is providing me with all the inputs that I need. What they realized, because this happened five years ago, uh, some communities decided not to keep, again, coming to our center to be trained and to get into this model. But then they realized that, okay, the government was here for one day, and then they disappeared. Uh, so, again, it's a process of trial and error, right? Uh, right now, again, these groups returned to this training center because they realized that we were providing them with technical support on a daily basis. We are there all the time to uh, suggest them and to provide them with some solutions to their daily needs, like from farming uh, potatoes, introducing some other crops, uh, introducing some cattle management. And then uh, what is uh, really happening is that the possibility of NGOs to bring these elements at the global, uh, at the national level, is really not working because the approach and the uh, impact that the government wants to have is like in that way providing resources immediately which is at the end of the day uh, something that is going to bring these parties we know these uh, political parties what they want to have at the end of the day are some votes and that's all and at that moment what they do is provide like everything for the population but they are not going to be there in a sustainable model. So yeah, lobby at the national level within NGOs is not easy. At the same time, we are trying to do some, some work on that uh, agenda. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much.